Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, I've got the Ohio shirt on today because we're talking about some Ohio boys. This is Extra History's story of the great locomotive chase, which resulted in the very first medals of honor ever issued in American history. And they were all given to men from Ohio regiments uh, for their involvement in the Andrews Raid. So uh, we're going to dive into this story. I'll put the link down in the description to Extra History's original video so you can check that out and all of their other fantastic content. This is the channel I react to more than any other just because they have such a great variety of content. They do such a wonderful job of telling a story and it makes it very easy for us to then use that as our textbook for us to be able to talk more in depth about this. And speaking of talking more in depth about this, one of the very first trips I ever took as part of vlogging through history was my trip to Georgia. It was actually where I met JD from the History Underground for the first time. As part of that trip, I visited Chattanooga, Tennessee, where I went to the National Cemetery, which is where uh, Andrews and several of his raiders are buried as well as Desmond Doss and others and so I'll put a link down in the description to the video that I made from that cemetery where I told the story of the Andrews raid showed their graves uh, and told some of their stories as well so without any further ado let's go ahead and dive into this one Big Shanty Georgia April 12th 1862 Conductor William A. Fuller checks his engine, the general, before taking his break during the train's breakfast stop. And as he walks into the hotel for a quick bite, he thinks maybe he should alert someone about the 20 men who'd gotten on at the last stop. They were furtive and tense, probably Confederate deserters. But before he can do that or spoon up some eggs, he hears something strange. The huffing of his beloved machine. Outside, the general has decoupled from its passenger cars and is pulling away. And aboard, he sees the suspicious men. Not deserters. Train robbers! <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, first of all, let's just talk about the importance of trains in the American Civil War. This is a huge logistical, behind-the-scenes part of... Uh, what's going on. It's about moving supplies. It's about moving troops. The first battle of Bull Run, uh, the first major battle of the American Civil War, is won in large part because of trains, because they're able to load up uh, an entire Confederate army and move it to the battlefield uh, from where it was stationed in the Shenandoah Valley without the Union being onto it in time. Uh, but moving supplies is huge. Moving men is huge. Uh, so then, because you know that's such a big deal, cutting those rail lines and preventing your enemy from using his rail effectively is going to be a major goal for both sides. Uh, you know, the reason that the Union goes after Petersburg instead of Richmond uh, late in the war in 1864 is because Petersburg is a rail hub that supplies. Richmond and supplies the Confederate forces. And so going after the enemy's ability to move things rapidly is seen as important right off the bat. And that's part of why this raid happens. Dead pursues the shortened train on foot, trying his hardest to catch his engine, falling behind as he shouts for help from passersby. But listen, all y'all, this is no robbery. It's sabotage! <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was pretty good. Train noises. Today's historical heist is made possible by our creator-owned and operated streaming service, Nebula, where you can get access to our next series two whole weeks early and ad-free. Aboard the General, James J. Andrews is watching William Fuller drop further and further behind. <laughs> They've done it! After all of the planning, all of the preparation, they're heading north on a hijacked Confederate train. Now, Andrews is not a soldier. Right. In fact, exactly what he is remains a subject of conjecture to this day. He'd held a string of odd jobs over the course of his life, including smuggling medicine across the Union blockade, but he'd come to the attention of the Union Army for his services as a scout and spy. And right, he he's the perfect kind of guy to do something like this, but of course you have to remember that if you are a, ci a civilian or a soldier in civilian clothes operating behind enemy lines, you're a spy. Whether you're actually spying or doing sabotage, you're a spy, and by the rules of war, can be executed. 
he'd pitched them on an audacious sabotage operation. He and a strike team would infiltrate into enemy territory, capture a locomotive, and run it northward, destroying railways, bridges, and telegraph lines behind them. This would help isolate Confederate forces in Tennessee from the rest of the rebel states and prepare the ground for the Union to move in and capture the major railway junction at Chattanooga. Yeah, uh, so the, at the, this point in the war, uh, it's early on in the war, but you have to remember East Tennessee is very pro-Union already. Uh, Chattanooga is super important. That We'll see that as the war plays out, uh, how much fighting happens around Chattanooga. The second bloodiest battle of the Civil War is going to happen right outside Chattanooga at Chickamauga. Uh, and then, of course, Chattanooga is going to be the jumping off point for the move on Atlanta in 1864. Uh, but while this Andrews raid is going down, you've got the Battle of Shiloh happening. So the, the Union has already taken Nashville after Fort Henry and Donelson fell. So East Tennessee is largely in Union hands, or West Tennessee is largely in Union hands. East Tennessee is already pro Union. So Chattanooga is kind of the big key to really securing the rest of Tennessee. To the Union generals, now working with depleted forces as combat moved west, it was worth a shot. But Andrew's first raid was called off after they'd reached the target, only to find that the train's engineer, a secret Union sympathizer, had been transferred. They got back safely, but the eight raiders who'd accompanied him weren't keen to go again. Because if found, they would be hanged yep. as spies, so he appealed to three regiments of Ohio troops for volunteers. My name is James J. Andrews, and I'm putting together a special team. I need me 20 soldiers. 20. Railroad. Love it. So he's speaking with a bit of a southern accent. I think Andrews is from Kentucky. Uh, so he probably did have a bit of that accent. Um, most of the soldiers that are going to make up this team are from the 2nd Ohio. I think there's a few from two other Ohio regiments as well. 21st and maybe the 31st. I can't remember. Soldiers. We're going to be sneaking into Georgia dressed as civilians. And we're going to be doing one thing and one thing only. Stealing trains. And I want my trains. Uh, okay, now I get what he's doing. He's doing Inglorious Bastards. This is uh, this is Brad Pitt's character from uh, from Inglorious Bastards. All right, cool. Okay, of course not so Tarantino, but you get the picture. And now Andrews had his train. In fact, the operation had gone swimmingly. Twenty of the twenty-four raiders actually made it onto the train. Two had been caught, assumed to be deserters and pressed into a Confederate artillery regiment, while two others had gotten to the hotel where the team met, but then overslept and missed the train, which is a vibe I can personally relate with. But the main force had remained undetected and were now heading north, which is ironically when things went south. See, they couldn't exactly sneak south while carrying a bunch of equipment and gunpowder, so they didn't have any actual tools to sabotage the rails. Andrews managed to borrow a crowbar during one of the train's scheduled stops, but that didn't do much. Next, they'd collected railroad ties as firewood to burn any bridges that they'd crossed, but it had been raining for days, so mm. nothing would light. The best they could do was cut telegraph cables, mostly by hooking the things as they passed and using the momentum of the train to pull them down. Also, people in the towns they passed were getting suspicious. See, back then, rail employees were well known in the towns they passed through. Sort of like your local mail carriers. It was always the same crew. So then when it was suddenly a bunch of new guys, that's a little weird. They also kept getting snarled in traffic. Of course, the raiders knew that the general's route involved scheduled stops to let other trains pass, but the war had meant a lot of delayed trains and rerouting, meaning that the waits stretched longer than usual. Hard to have a car chase in traffic, you know? So it, this all goes to show you that plans are great, but plans never survive contact with the enemy, so to speak. In this case, the enemy is just the, the circumstances uh, and the situations that you're dealing with. And, and as much as you can prepare for that, you can't account for things that just come up. And make no mistake, it was a chase because their biggest problem was that they were being followed yep. by who you ask? Who exactly was this small figure in the distance disappearing when they stoked the engine and then reappearing when they stopped? <laughs> William Fuller. Yeah. The determined conductor apparently never skipped leg day because he was doggedly still following them on foot after miles. Granted, a fairly normal thing for rail employees to do, for they often had to run ahead of or behind trains. At least he was running at first, because soon Andrew saw a vehicle coming around the bend. It was Fuller, yep. but now he'd found a hand car, and he was pumping his way towards his beloved machine. Still, they left him behind until an old train engine started checking up behind them because Fuller had upgraded again. Now they <laughs> He keeps upgrading. That's exactly how this all went down, too. 
Their train was being chased by another train. Worse still, an interchange switch operator, suspicious, refused to change the tracks to let the general head north. When Andrews did it himself, well, it was clear they weren't just some new rail crew. That'd be like going into the tower at an airport and clearing a plane for takeoff when it wasn't its turn. So the game was up. The Confederates were alerted, and all they could do was run. Then there was a tense and moment. it's not like these trains are going 70 miles an hour and you're just not going to catch them. It, it didn't quite work like that. When another locomotive approached them from the opposite direction, a powerful engine, the Texas, presumably carrying soldiers, Andrews and his crew held their breath, and it went past. Whew! That was close. Wait, nope. A minute later, it appeared again behind them. Rather than turning around, it was simply now running in reverse. And who was on the caboose? Fuller. The raiders began throwing railroad ties out the back, hoping to stop the engine. Fuller's men simply knocked them aside with bars. Then Andrews' crew decoupled one boxcar after another, hoping to cause a collision with the Texas. But get this, with Fuller's train running in reverse, he could just hook them up to his train and make it bigger. And when they sighted the smoke of another train ahead, Andrews knew it was time to bug out. They scattered into the woods, hoping a few of them would make it, but there were Confederate units mustering all over the countryside, and the search parties were just too big. Every raider was caught, even the two who'd missed the train because a hotel porter hadn't woken them up on time. Andrews managed to escape from prison, but was recaptured the same day. Then after a trial that only lasted hours, he was hanged as a spy, strangling rather than having his neck broken because he was so tall that his feet hit the ground when he was dropped. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so I mean, by this point, hanging is a science, and they have a really good idea of, I mean, if, you, if you're good at it, something to be good at, I know, but if you're good at it as an executioner, you know exactly how much rope you need and how far the drop needs to be in order for an efficient hanging. Hanging is not supposed to strangle you. It's supposed to break your neck and kill you instantly. It doesn't always happen. If the rope's too long, it'll pop your head right off. If it's too short, you strangle, and that's what happened here. But Andrews is despite the fact that he's a civilian, he is buried at the Chattanooga National Cemetery in the same kind of semicircle with the uh, the soldiers who were executed with him in June of 1862. Several others were executed before the South seemed to lose their stomach for it. After all, despite the mayhem, little damage was done and no one was actually killed. So the prospect of 22 executions started to look a little disproportionate. The rest of the Raiders, miraculously, eventually made it back alive. The two that were pressed into service later deserted and made it back to Union lines. Eight of those held as prisoners exchanged. of war escaped, breaking up into pairs. Oh. Six made their way north, Some were exchanged. Two, sort of brilliantly, went south instead. Making it to Florida, they got their hands on a boat and rowed out to a U.S. naval vessel blockading the port. Then the remaining six were traded in a prisoner exchange later in the war, and they returned to all find themselves lauded as heroes, both in newspapers and in a special new way. Sensing the war weariness of the country, in 1862, the War Department had decided to raise morale by creating a medal for bravery. Much now, you'll see in pictures, this is the Medal of Honor, but you'll see a lot of men in pictures wearing a medal that looks very similar to that, except the eagle that you see here above the medal uh, is actually up at the top. Uh, and that is the GAR medal, the Grand Army of the Republic. The Grand Army of the Republic was the fraternal organization, kind of like the VFW uh, or the Foreign Legion. It was, it was made up of veterans of the war so that they could continue to get together after the war and have reunions. And pretty much every town in the north had a local GAR post that was usually named after a local soldier who had died in the war. Uh, or by or after some famous general, so so it, it, it's really easy to uh, mix up the GAR medal and the Medal of Honor because they are so similar. Uh, but you have to remember at this time there are no other medals that are given out by the uh, United States. There's no Purple Heart, anything like that, and so the standard for a Medal of Honor in the Civil War is different than it is today. There were thousands of Medals of Honor given out during the Civil War. Uh, at one point. Uh, one regiment was offered everyone in the unit a medal of honor if they re-enlisted. Uh, and so that those kinds of things happened. 
uh, which kind of cheapened the metal. And so years and even decades later, they would go back and reevaluate. And actually in the 1890s, a bunch more medals of honor were given out to people like Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and Dan Sickles. And a lot of the most famous medals of honor that people know about from the Civil War were only given out in the 1890s. But yeah, the first, uh, I think, six, six or eight medals of honor that were ever given were given to these Ohio soldiers from the Andrews Raid who survived as the British Empire had done six years before with the Victoria Cross. Yet, by the time the Raiders arrived back in the prisoner exchange in March of 1863, it had not yet been awarded. So on March 25th, seven of the Raiders found themselves in the office of Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, receiving their Also nation. from Ohio. Also from Northeast Ohio. He's actually from Steubenville, which is pretty close to where some of these guys came from. His highest, and at the time, only award for valor in combat. Private Jacob Parrott, who had been beaten as a prisoner, was the first. And it's really interesting to note how these awards set the mold for what the Medal of Honor would become. The recipients were all military, the civilians including Andrews did not receive it, and after the presentation, they met Lincoln at the White House who personally thanked them, a ritual which continues to this day. Over the next several years, more Raiders would get the award, helping set the precedent that it could be awarded posthumously. Yeah, and, the and that's... It seems like a no-brainer to us now, right? Because it seems more often than not in modern times that the Medal of Honor is awarded posthumously more than it is to living soldiers. But the Victoria Cross and the Medal of Honor, both, there were questions about that. Could Can you give it to someone after, after they died? Uh, so it wasn't quite as obvious then as, as it is now. The fact that this was a failed operation that killed zero enemy soldiers hammered home that this was not an award for victory or inflicting violence, but rather doing one's duty under extreme danger. Today, both locomotives, the General yep. and the Texas, reside in museums, and the executed raiders are buried together near a monument to the raid. The event has been the subject of two films, including a silent Buster Keaton comedy, The General, considered a treasure of early Hollywood. Yeah, this is considered one of the greatest early movies in history, in large part because of the stunts that were done that were all, many of them, done re for real. Seriously, if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. It's pretty good. Andrews failed to capture Chattanooga, but his raid did capture our imaginations ever since. And imagination is a hell of a drug. Like, could you imagine, say, I don't know, a place where hundreds of your favorite creators not only... So, uh, he, he was never trying to capture Chattanooga. I know they were just using that word for the segue, but uh, it, it's a really fascinating story. Uh, about how that all went down. And I would encourage you, if you ever have the chance to go to Chattanooga, they have the National Medal of Honor Heritage Center, which I also did a video about that. I'll put that link down in the description as well. But I encourage you to check out the Medal of Honor Heritage Center. I encourage you to check out Chattanooga National Cemetery. Visit the Andrews Raiders. They're buried right down near the, the front uh, entrance to this uh, to the cemetery. Like I said, Desmond Doss is buried there. There's actually some German POWs who are buried there. Uh, it's a really, really cool place to visit. And there's some great history in Chattanooga. You've got Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge uh, battlefields. And then just right down the road, maybe 20 minutes away, uh, is the Chickamauga battlefield. So it's all worth your time. Uh, but thank you guys so much for watching. I'll put the links up on the screen as well as down in the description. Check those videos out. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.